So welcome everyone. Uh, thanks so much to Richard Crowley, who's here from Singapore Management University. Uh, Richard has a India connection, I think somehow. He has been uh, attending uh, conferences in India regularly. And that's why we are very grateful for that. Uh, so Richard uh, had, did his PhD at the University of Illinois and his uh, talk is on textual analysis, context, and its implication for sentiment. Uh, just quickly, some ground rules uh, for everybody. Uh, Richard will have the first five minutes under uninterrupted, and so we won't ask any questions. After that, the floor is open for questions. Uh, just to make it a little bit more uh, structured, I uh, request that people just either raise their hand or indicate that they have a question on the chat box, and then I will uh, announce that you have a question, and then Richard can ask, and, and you can unmute and ask your question. So. Don't post the entire question on the chat unless you want to. Okay, and if you want to, that's fine. Richard can answer it offline if he needs. Okay, so with that, we'll uh, 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 open the talk with, uh, so Richard, it's all yours, thanks. Okay. So this paper is uh, titled Understanding Sentiment Through Context. This is with Franco Wong uh, at University of Toronto. Uh, as I told Srini, this is a pretty new paper. Uh, what you guys are, are seeing is the first draft, so it's still a bit rough. Um, and so I'm aware of that, happy to take any questions you may have about it because we definitely need to revise it um, and we'll take those into account. Um, if you want to copy the slides, you can just go to my website at https slash uh, slash slash rmc.link. Um, the slides are up on there uh, publicly available, so you can uh, feel free to th flip through that as you'd like. Um, okay, so let me go through a bit of the motivation about this paper first, right? Um, now, I was telling Srini, there's a sort of a story behind this paper and that uh, this paper is motivated essentially by a question Franco used to ask me every time I went to Toronto. So I've been to Toronto uh, a lot more than I should have, given that I'm in Singapore. Um, and essentially, every time I'm in his office, he just asks me, essentially, like, what is sentiment? Or more precisely, what is sentiment measuring? And the thing is, if you really start thinking about what exactly sort of your traditional sentiment measures capture, it's not really clear what the theoretical construct is, right? So I'm not talking about what they're capturing empirically, right? That's, you know, I mean, you can just look at the dictionary, you know exactly what it's doing. But, right, what exactly is it from a theoretical perspective, I think is a bit less clear. And so I never really had a very good um, answer for him, right? And so the, the question was then to see whether or not we could essentially answer this question of what is it actually picking up, right? Um, all right, and so, I think it's, uh, it's a tricky question largely because of the way we apply sentiment measures, right? We have a sentiment dictionary, we simply count the number of words in the sentence, um, and we kind of ignore everything else in the document, right? But of course, obviously, something like an annual report is a very rich document, there's a lot going on, and throwing all that out makes things a little bit tricky, right? Um, and in particular, if you really want to say, you know, here's where the sentiment comes from, just telling me which sentiment words showed up or how many of them there were doesn't really give you enough information to answer that, right? So if you look at, say, the Lawfare McDowell dictionaries, right, or the, the Henry dictionary or the Harvard Ford dictionary, or Harvard IV dictionary, right, um, it's not very clear typically what the context of a lot of the words is, right? If you really want to explain it, you're, what you have to do is you have to go back to the sentence. And then in the context of that sentiment, you can sentence, you can tell me, oh, this is why this is positive, right? Or this is why this is negative, right? And so the idea is that the context is really the key to answering the question of what are we picking up, right? And so that's sort of our starting point for the paper. We want to use context to try and go back and answer a bit of what exactly it is we're doing in accounting and finance, right? So this is, uh, I will say up front, this is a methodology paper purely. There's it's just a methodology paper, right? Um, and so uh, the flavor is a little bit different because we're going to be very heavy on the sort of approach of how we measure context and how we bring that into this discussion. And we're simply going to sort of be reflective on the literature sort of as things were in the past. Um, now here's a simple sort of motivating example, right? So if I was to ask you, say, what does you know, uh, a sentiment word mean from a document, right? And you go back to text, right? Let's say we take the word loss, right? Now, in the Law for McDonald Dictionary, this is a negative word, right? And we can look at some actual examples, right? So for instance, one example is net loss was due to 4.7 million goodwill write-off. That looks pretty, pretty standard. That's good, right? So it's, you know, net losses, that's pretty much what we'd expect, even if we didn't have the context, right? That's fine. 
Um, and we can see, of course, if we want to dig in deeper, right? It's a good one. Uh, then we have, say, loss ratio decreased to 43% as a result of the segment's adherence to underwriting guidelines and claims. Well, that's not negative, right? Because it says losses decreased, right? So we're missing that crucial bit of context about decreasing losses. Uh, and actually, that one sort of would, would go opposite to what we might expect, right? Uh, alternatively, we have, say, this sentence here, functional copies are dedicated to weight loss, right? That's another type of loss. That is not financial loss. That's not really what we want to pick up, but certainly our measure picks that up, right? I mean, our, the, the measures we use in accounting and finance pick that up. Um, and then you have some other issues, like, for instance, mentions of loan loss provisions. Um, it's a very frequent, uh, if, if you were to go and just categorize sort of every mention of loss in every 10K in the past uh, 20 years, right? You'll get about 5 to 10% of mentions of loss are loan loss provisions. And that's more of a thing where if a bank didn't mention loan loss provisions, you'd be really concerned, right? So this is not a bad thing to show up. It needs to be there, right? Um, and so the point is to say that it really depends on context whether or not this makes sense, right? The first one, yeah, perfect, right? That's exactly what we want. Second one's opposite. And three and four are sort of mishits in different ways. Um, and so to some extent, a main contribution of our study is to do this type of analysis, but not just for one sentence at a time, but for you know tens of millions of sentences across you know decades of annual reports, essentially. Um, so we can do this en masse and then sort of go back and then reflect on how sort of doing this type of uh, analysis will give us insight into what we were actually picking up in various tests uh, in the literature. Uh, now, when I talk about context, right, the main context we're going to be looking at is the context through which uh, a word came from, right? So it's looking at, say, things like these, where you have trees of words, right? So we're going to use some grammar parsing to actually go and construct the grammar tree behind or syntax tree behind a sentence, right? So you know, simple things could be just, you know, loss is modified by net, right? Or it could be more complicated ones. Uh, and then we'll also look at economic context, right? So we'll look at varying what problem we're looking at, right? So for instance, are we looking at something that's related to stock returns? Or are we looking at something that's related to uh, say, uh, like internal control weaknesses, right? And under these different contexts, we would hope that our measure is consistent, right? Meaning we'd hope that when it's negative under one context, it's hopefully negative under the other context. Uh, and we simply want to just test, is that true or not, right? We, we're going to this with a fairly agnostic approach, um, but the results will show that it's, it's not so consistent, unfortunately. Uh, I have a yep. question to start, yep. um, and this may be a little off the wall. That's fine. Uh, so you, uh, if you think about uh, nouns and verbs, yep. in general, nouns and verbs are neutral, Yep. whereas adjectives and adverbs are what make them interesting. They qualify them and make them interesting. Yep. So uh, even a word, I was thinking even a word like uncertainty. Mm -hmm. If you remove D stem it and remove the T Y, mm -hmm. yep. it becomes an adjective. So does it yep. make then so I was thinking, doesn't it make sense to just measure sentiment based on the use of adjectives and adverbs as opposed to using these clauses that you are uh, trying to parse? Ah, a, no, no. So so we're trying to evaluate the existing dictionaries, right? And okay. so the question should be, what does Law for McDonald do, right? And if you look at the dictionary, you'll find, yes, you're, they mostly agree with you, right? It's mostly going to be adjectives that they're looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. The word loss is a bit of a outlier in that it's, it's a noun in this case, right? Um, of course, it could be other forms under English, but in the context of accounting, it's usually a noun. Um, but most of their words are adjectives in their dictionary. Um, and so they, they would agree with you, right? Our question is then simply to say, okay, if I take an adjective, right? does the context change the meaning of that adjective, right? So if I say uncertain, does the context around that sometimes mean uncertain could be a good thing or a bad thing, right? Or maybe sometimes neutral, right? And so what we want to do is to sort of enrich the understanding of these adjectives, right? Richard, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, this yep. is Prabhu here. Yep. Uh, so LM 2011, they don't talk about how they came up with that word, right? Uh, well, okay, so they're, they're not as detailed as they should be, but I've talked with Lawfren about exactly how it's calculated. Um, so 
you go ahead so, ask your question. so is there any uh, manual process involved in the way they come up with that word list it is 100 percent manual um, in fact so the the way they approach it as i understand is they um so they counted every word in every 10k up to the point of uh, where they were studying it and then subject to a, a minimum number of occurrences of the word they manually went through every single word and assigned it as negative positive or no sentiment um, and they uh, i think both law firm mcdonald did this independently and when they agreed it was fine when they disagreed they would discuss if they couldn't come to an agreement then they would bring in a third party to mediate. Um, and so actually, yes, it's it's an extremely manual approach, um, which is generally a good thing in the context of the data set they're working on, right? So for 10Ks, that means the data set is probably reasonably well, or their, their measures reasonably well specified. However, it also means that their, their measure is very 10K oriented, right? So if you're doing it, say, on data set that's not 10Ks, well, it's a little less clear whether or not it should work. Yeah. Okay, yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that was because uh, the paper wasn't very clear about uh, yeah. how they came up with that word list. So, yeah. so here you're pitting uh, one mechanism against a more manual approach where uh, there is a human involvement where we've actually gone through the context of each sentence. Yeah, so I won't say we're pitting it against per se. What you'll find uh, later on in the paper is we're bifurcating, they're splitting up their measure based on a, a automatic process, right? Um, and there's some manual parts in terms of the labeling for ours, but the, the actual sort of distribution cutting of the measure is completely automated. Um, but yeah, so we, we will take their measure as given essentially though, right? And uh, I should state, actually, I think the next slide will state it anyway. Um, so we have some plans for how we're going to expand the paper going forward. One is to add more data sets, right? So instead of just looking at 10 case, look at something like say earnings, uh, earnings announcements as well. Um, the other option, uh, so the first one we'll definitely do. The second one we may also do is to look at some other dictionaries as well, right? So that'll also help to uh, enrich this a bit. Um, now to go over a bit of what we do, right? Now, uh, our main idea here is we're gonna start by identifying essentially any useful text, um, we do this through a, a methodology from Stanford NLP. Um, so it's purely a linguistic approach to this based on uh, essentially the way a sentence is written, word order, and the adjective, or not that, the, the uh, grammatical parts in that sentence and how they're ordered, right? So it's purely just a linguistic approach to that. Um, that's going to be essentially identifying uh, various clauses um, throughout sentences, right? So that just gives us sort of these chunks that allow us to get some insight into what exactly the words within each chunk mean. The second is then to uh, essentially assign a given context to each of these clauses. Uh, then we're going to look at how dictionary sentiment will depend on these different contexts, right? So we'll sort of flip the tables a bit, right? Usually you see, you see sentiment as the independent variable going into regression. Here we're actually going to pick apart sentiment based on the contexts that is coming from, right? So see whether certain contexts are driving sentiment. And then we're going to replicate, uh, uh, at the moment, we're mostly replicating Law for McDonald. Uh, the future will replicate a few other studies as well uh, to look at how uh, looking at context impacts the results from these studies, right? And in particular, part of this is to understand how stable our uh, sentiment measures that we use in accounting finance are um, as we vary context uh, in terms of economic context, right? So if we were to change from one economic context to another, is the measure the same or are we actually measuring something completely different and not realizing it? Um, but at the end of the day, these are of course just to understand essentially how does sentiment work in our context of accounting and finance. Okay. Uh, Richard, yeah. I have a yes. question. Hmm? Um, so uh, at some point, are you going to kind of uh, compare your approach to say a, um, purely NLP-based approach without use of, let's say, LM or any other dictionary. Uh, many professional firms use this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what is the advantage of sticking to the dictionaries and then defining context using NLP as opposed to purely NLP approach? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Uh, this is something we've thought about as well is should we, uh, it's, it's more about positioning the paper at that point, right? So should we position it as trying to see what's the best sentiment approach or 
should we stick to a pure methodology approach? Um, our goal at the moment is not to say, here's the best approach sentiment, which is definitely going to be the, the pure NLP approach, like you said. Uh, <laughs> those definitely work much better than what we typically mm -hmm. use in accounting. There are other people doing that already, right? So for instance, Alan Huang has some work on that with his Finbert paper. Mm -hmm. um, and so our interest isn't so much in that part as it is to reflect on the you know, hundreds to thousands of papers that have used these measures already. Mm -hmm. right? What we want to say is, should you know, maybe, maybe our interpretation of some of these old results is incorrect because maybe the measure isn't what we thought it was. And so that's more or less the, the, the perspective we're taking right now. Uh, Go but on. yeah, we, we've, definitely, we've definitely sort of thought back and forth. Should, you know, should we, maybe we should take Alan Huang's Finbert and toss that in the paper too to show how that compares, right? That's something we could do. Sure, sounds uh, good, thanks. Yep. So uh, just to follow up, I think uh, mm -hmm. some, uh, you know, when I read the first uh, page or two in the paper, mm -hmm. uh, you talk about the LM paper and the fact that it's well, well used. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you introduce the idea that you are, uh, Use, going to use context, basically the grammar, the structure, and, and the uh, order of the words inside a sentence. Yep. So what that did was where it sort of set up the reader to expect that you're going to run a horse race. So uh, that's, I think, some yeah. of the questions are coming from that. And then when you end up, when I win and read the results section, you end up using mm. LM uh, yep. itself. So that kind of uh, yes. threw me off. Yeah. Yeah, so, no, I, th I think yeah, we, we need to rewrite <laughs> You want to yeah, clarify it up front here yeah. that you're not yeah, really yeah. doing the horse race against LM. Yep, so I completely agree. Yeah, that's a, that's something we need to do is to pretty much just completely rewrite the whole intro because I think it's it's not the most clear. Um, so yeah, yeah, the point well taken. Uh, okay, uh, so I think with that I'll move on to how we approach context, right? So what's the methodology of the paper, right? Uh, so our idea, as I sort of alluded to before is to try and replicate how I would how I would do it if I was doing manually, but not do it manually because as I said, we have tens of millions of sentences and that will take years to decades to manually do. Uh, and so our general idea is simply to uh, well to just go through each each sentence, right? So we're gonna actually make a make or you make use of an NLP algorithm. That will go through, read the documents. It'll extract a um, set of sentences. We'll look at clause level because that's a little bit cleaner, right? And it can do that uh, by itself, right? And so we're going to do it at clause level. Then we'll look to see sort of how, how these different clauses are related to each other, right? And use that to build these contexts, right? So we'll build the contexts from the clause that are extracted from each, uh, each of these annual reports. Then we're going to use that to interpret the words in the context of where they came from. Right. So instead of just saying I have the word loss, it's now I have the word loss and we're discussing, you know, decreases in earnings versus I have the word loss and we're discussing increases in earnings or I have the word loss and we're discussing healthcare. Right. And we can sort of make it conditional on the context it came from. Right. And that'll help us to sort of emulate the way that we would do this manually. Um, so to look at a, just to have a quick illustration of how the context part works, right? So we take this sentence, uh, the company's earnings increased by 5% uh, due to an improvement in operating efficiency, right? So this is the reconstructed sentence with the uh, grammar tree, which you can see how essentially the words relate to one another. And what we can do is then we can ask the algorithm, okay, what's a, let's distill this instead of just taking the full sentence, let's distill it down to the important parts, right? So one part is we would say, okay, we're talking about company's earnings. Right, that's one logical component of this, right? And we can see that from the uh, from the arrows in here, right? How they've sort of one little cycle there, um, right? So we have, what does this mean, right? We are saying the company has earnings, right? That's that's essentially what we're getting at from that little chunk, right? Uh, so that's that's one potential extraction from the sentence. Another one is to expand a little bit. We say company you know, has earnings, and they increase by five percent, right? So that, that's, I think, quite useful from an accounting perspective, right? That's something we'd expect to see, right? And the, when we distill this, we'd say, okay, we're talking about company's earnings. That's the, sort of the, the subject of the sentence here. The action increases by, and how much? 5%. Another way to look at this is to sort of look at it across the sentence, right? So we have the company's earnings here, and those increased, why? Well, because we have an improvement in operating efficiency, right? So our methodology allows us to skip around the grammar tree, 
right? So we're not just stuck with say continue, contiguous words, right? So it's not like n-grams where we're stuck with just words over a certain radius, but actually we will be able to traverse the tree structure of a sentence. Whereas I mean, with a small one like this, there's not too much to traverse, but if you've read any reports, right, you know that they often have sentences in excess of about 200 words per sentence. And there being able to parse the tree actually uh, lets us get a lot more meaning from that. Um, all right, and so we'll get an extraction like that. Uh, and one last one, uh, it also say, well, maybe the improvement in part doesn't matter, right? We're just, what matters is that we, our earnings increased and it's because we had improved operating efficiency. Or I mean, just has it's increased due to operating efficiency, right? Um, so running this sentence essentially through the method that we use, which is called open information extraction, would give us these four potential outcomes, right? Now, of course we have one issue, right? Is that we have four, four essentially clauses constructed from one sentence. So we need to be able to figure out which of these matter. Uh, I'll show you guys a bit how we do that in a, in a bit. Um, uh, but, Richard, uh, uh, hi. Yep. Uh, go ahead, uh, should I? Yeah, okay, thanks sir. So uh, Richard, I have this uh, one question. Uh, yep. The whole financial text analysis when it started, the idea with, this is a, with the back of words approach, the, mm -hmm. where it came and then they talked about the problems with it. It's a one word at a time. So it doesn't take into consideration its neighbors. And then the whole argument of n-gram started with it. Yep. Uh, my idea here is, if you have a sentence, isn't it itself fine that you take the sentence as a base unit of your sentiment analysis because it's a base unit in itself? Second thing, the idea that you have to break it down into clusters, uh, such as what's that, you know, to take into consideration things such as earnings increased. Now, mm -hmm. I know that you have to break it down to know that, you know, earning increased, why, and to answer such things to look at the sentence. One of the things that this was taken care of earlier is that Locker and McDonald themselves specified that they do not quantify the words such as increase or decrease because it depends on what word they are used with, such as, you know, you talked about loss increase is bad and uh, earnings increase is good. Mm -hmm. There's one paper by April Briggs Grimaldi 2014 where they quantify Central Bank Communication of Sweden, where they uh, talk about whether it would be better to have a verb noun com verb noun combination as mm -hmm. well as an unigram dictionary and then use mm -hmm. it in a sentence level argument. Mm -hmm. So don't you think that would be better and would necessitate that wouldn't require you to you know break down a sentence because one other problem that would I think it will lead to I'm sure you must have faced it is that when you break down one single sentence into four clusters such as now you'll face a sparsity issue with whatever dictionary that you're using. So uh, how no. do you? We, we actually won't. How face do you that. Handle it? Uh, okay, so a few things, right? So one, ours is actually a refinement of that idea, right? So the noun verb pairs, right? Misses some of the some of what we're gonna find, right? Because what what ours actually is, let me just go to the next slide, right? It's a subject relation verb object pairing or triplet really, right? So yours is what you're talking about is subject verb or verb object. We do essentially subject verb object, right? So it's actually just a slightly larger variant of that, but we allow the subject or object to be more than one word if that's what it is linguistically, right? So it's, it's more of a generalization of that approach. Um, so I agree that it, it, it's certainly, it's better than just doing bag of words, but I think this is better than doing just verb and object. Um, and so I think ours is a bit related in that regard. Um, there's a second part to your question. Do you remember what that was? The idea there is that you you make clusters from one sentence. Ah, yeah, that yeah. would definitely okay, yeah. lead to, you know, a sparsity issue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll show you, uh, let me show you, I'll show you on the next slide, essentially. So uh, just give me a moment and I'll get through that. Um, oh, sorry, Richard, quick uh, follow up. I think just for somebody yep. uh, naive uh, or... Uh, hmm? Uh, reader or uh, reader of the paper, it might be yep. helpful in that example mm -hmm. to show what would you, uh, how would you, uh, you know, measure uh, that information using the LM approach? Because mm -hmm. you don't, uh, yeah. So how would you contrast? I mean, you said you don't want to contrast yep. with LM, but it yep. just it just makes me curious to know what that that specific yeah, sentence. Yeah. How yeah, would it good. translate in terms of LM, the LM approach? Yes, that, that's a good good point. Yeah, I, I should probably just highlight the sentence accordingly, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, so good that's point. what Professor uh, Shridi just said that, I mean, it would mm -hmm. be nice to have a comparison of what you do with the bag of words approach, then a verb noun approach, and then show that how your subject verb object approach is better and leads to, uh, you know, improved quantification of tone or sentiment. It would mm -hmm. help, I think. Yeah, I mean, 
I, I won't, I'm probably not going to do just the, the verb object part because again, ours is just a generalization of that anyway. Uh, but I think going maybe more directly showing about bag of words versus this would probably be useful. Because um, I think the, the bag of words is mostly what accounting and finance does anyway. And so it's kind of, I think most people's default approach, right? So it's, it's good to sort of make that a little bit more clear. Um, yes. Okay. So as I was saying, right, so our approach is going to construct essentially triplets like this, um, but they're roughly going to be clauses, right? But with some sort of, uh, it'll drop a lot of sort of less useful words, right? Uh, meaning words like the, an, of, et cetera, your typical stop words. Uh, this is all based on a, what's called dependency parse tree, meaning it's just looking at the grammatical structure of the sentence and using that to construct the, the tree, right? So it doesn't really care necessarily you know, what the sentence is about. It just cares about the grammar, right? And the words, all that matters is the, the grammar structure of them, right? Um, it will also do one nice thing, which is it resolves co-references, right? So when somebody, when a company is talking about things more generally, like talking about say, yeah, their product, blah, 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 and it blank, right? Uh, it'll replace it with the actual name, right? And so it'll resolve all these co-references that uh, have a tendency to appear in the longer sentences and annual reports, right? So that we can actually keep the context even across different clauses, which is quite helpful. Um, now, it will, of course, determine clause boundaries, right? That's something we need here. Uh, the reason why we, uh, I think this to Jalaj's earlier point, we should, uh, I should clarify, the reason we use clauses instead of sentences, right, is because annual reports like to use really long multi-clause sentences. And if you do a full sentence, right, then when you try and assign one word based on the sentence, you may actually accidentally assign it based on a different context, right? Meaning maybe clause one in the sentence is the sort of dominant longest clause and you define the words meaning based on that, but really it's in clause four or five in that sentence, right? And so that can lead to some misclassification. And uh, so by essentially identifying clause boundaries, this algorithm is gonna help clear up that. Um, and then at the end of the day, it'll assign everything to triples. We don't really care about the triple so much in this paper. We're going to essentially just take the amalgamation of subject, verb and object together. And we'll use that as the, the clause itself. Uh, now, running this on all the annual reports in our sample generates 179 million clauses, um, which is a lot. And of course, part of this is because of the issue we saw here, where it saw one simple sentence and said, hey, look, here's four clauses. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a way to dimensionally shrink this a bit, because we end up actually, instead of having a sparsity issue, we have the exact opposite. We have way too much, uh, and we need to cut it down. Um, and so the way we're going to cut this down is, well, one, by removing nested clauses, right? So for instance, as you may have saw here, right, companies has earnings or companies' earnings increased by 5%, right? This first clause is embedded in clauses two, three, and four, right? It's completely redundant. So there's no need to keep it. Um, likewise, this clause is also embedded in here, right? And so we will typically remove nested extractions, uh, but subject... Uh, so our, our key is going to be we want to actually keep shorter extractions when possible, but we don't want to drop the law firm McDonald words because that would bias against their dictionary, and we don't want to introduce any bias against them. And we also don't really want to drop accounting content because we're looking at 10K filings, and if we just accidentally drop an accounting word, that kind of kills a lot of our context, right? And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to use a couple other dictionaries as baselines of words that could be accounting related. And we will never drop any word in those dictionaries, and we'll never drop a word that's in Law for McDonald. Using this process, we'll cut out about 73% of all of these uh, of these clauses. It'll drop us down to about 48 million extractions, which is manageable. Still a lot of data to work with, but we can we can handle it. Um, the kind of content is coming from uh, Campbell Harvey's uh, hypertextual uh, finance glossary, uh, which has um, quite a lot of words in it. Quite quite a long dictionary. Um, has some unique words like demonetization or boilerplate or deductible, right? These are all things that we'd expect to see. Um, and we also use the uh, New York State Society of CPAs accounting terminology guide, where they have a one, about a thousand plus terms uh, from accounting finance, uh, which includes things like GASB, MDNA, and periodicity, right? Um, and of course, there's a lot of overlap in these dictionaries. Um, and so, of course, we, that, that's fine, right? We'd expect that. Uh, but they do have some words that are unique. So we use both of them to make sure we have a fairly uh, covering set of accounting and finance terms. Um, now, we do do a few things to make these a little bit more usable from a machine perspective, right? Because these two dictionaries, unlike Law from McDonald Dictionary, they're not meant to be used in this, this way, right? So we're going to transform them to machine readable dictionaries first by removing 
terms that could be easily sort of mis, uh, misrepresented. For instance, the word A happens to be in uh, Campbell Harvey's dictionary because uh, he has A as the, uh, the postfix for NASDAQ stocks, right? It, it has a specific meaning in the context of NASDAQ, but it, uh, in most of our sample, that would be uh, misclassification. So we, we drop anything shorter than four characters because those tend to be um, not specific to accounting or finance. Uh, we'll also remove typical stop words because those are likely to be used, but not in a useful context. Um, we also restrict it to only single words, but that means that for the phrases, we actually manually review all phrases that are uh, not single words already covered by some other word in the dictionary. Um, so that way we can make sure that we could identify every term in the dictionary, should it be in our document. And lastly, uh, we're going to actually inflect everything as well. Right? So for instance, the, the word periodicity is in the dictionary, but periodicities, plural is not, nor periodic. Um, and so we'll inflect every single word in these dictionaries to make sure we're covering everything possible. Right? Um, so it's a, we end up with a fairly large set of words that we're making sure we don't drop just to make sure we maintain any bit of relevant context from a finance or accounting perspective. Because again, we don't want to bias against anything here, right? So we, we err on the side of caution here. We end up with, of course, more, uh, more clauses and longer clauses than we would have otherwise, uh, but that's, that's fine. Um, the next step then is to say, okay, we have 48 million clauses now. So how do we cluster these together such that we can then identify what the context is, right? And we want to do this in a way that doesn't introduce researcher bias. That's sort of the, the leading principle for this this paper is that we want to do everything in a way that's automated, replicable, and doesn't introduce bias, right? The way we're going to do this is using something called Universal Sentence Encoder. It's uh, from Sir et al. 2018. This is a paper by uh, some guys at Google, um, which is essentially a way of uh, taking anything that's roughly sentence length. So it could be a little bit shorter, like clause. It could be longer, like paragraphs. But essentially, they're mapping these sentences to a vector space that's 512 dimensional that roughly encodes sentences with similar meanings to be in similar locations, right? Meaning that the distance between two points in this vector space is meaningful. Now, the vector space itself, right? The dimensions themselves are not meaningful. They're not human understandable. But the key is that if things are close together, they tend to be about the same meaning, right? That's, the, that's what we're going to be using, right? So if you had, the, say, these six sentences here, right? The three in red happen to be sim they're close together. The distance is small. And so we could cluster those. And same with the three in blue here. Right, again, the distance is small, we can cluster them together. For the clustering, for now, we're using mini batch k means, uh, just because this is one of the few clustering alg algorithms that uh, we can run in a batch setting because you need about 200 gigabytes of memory to actually execute this uh, if you didn't have a batching method. Uh, so Richard, and so sorry, this uh, is doable. Uh, this is the part that I lost uh, you in the paper also. Okay. Uh, not really sure, because you see it's not machine readable. So when you said, I mean, the mm -hmm. first naive thing that I thought 512 left, and you said it's bounded from one to minus one. Oh, sorry, free, minus free one dimension, one. yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what is it, uh, can you say in plain English what this 512 really is doing? It, I understand you're taking uh, one four million words, yep. uh, four million classes, and yep. collapsing it down into 131 categories. Yep. Right? Ultimately, you're going to code uh, transform each each uh, firm year is going to be characterized by a 131 vector, right. uh, 131 by one vector, right? But the 512, uh, it didn't. Uh, yeah. So this is it's just an interim layer in this process, right? So it's it's a common thing in computer science where you use something called embeddings, right? This is an example of that methodology. Uh, I can get, show you a, a simple example here with some okay. simple sentences, right? So here, where we have uh, sentences, uh, simple sentences like "What's up? How are you feeling? How are you?" And also, how old are you? How old are you in years? And what is your age? Right. And this graph here shows the similarity as reported by Universal Sense Encoder, where similarity is just based on distance, right? So how close they are, uh, or actually, well, one minus how close they are, so how uh, how similar they are. And what you see is that, for instance, the how are you feeling and how are you, right? They end up very close together, as you'd expect, right? Just, we know in English those are similar, right? Uh, but also, you look and say, how are you versus how old are you, right? You'll note that. Right, for how are you feeling and how are you? Three of the four words are shared, right? Same with how old are you and how are you, right? But you'll see there's a stark contrast in terms of its ratings, right? It says, you know, how are you feeling? Very similar. How old are you? It's very different, right? This is sort of the, the key reason we use this measure is because it's actually relatively sen uh, 
it's sensitive to the meaning of a sentence and not so sensitive to word choice, right? Um, so what I mean is, right, even though there's three, three of the four words are shared in both cases, it knows that these are completely different contexts, right? Um, and whereas something like cosine similarity that we typically use in accounting would completely fail this test. Uh, similarly, right, the what's up versus how, how are you feeling? No shared words, but it knows these are the same. The reason is what Google has done is they've trained this on billions of documents, right? So they took billions of documents and they actually are using word order to build this 512 dimensions, right? And so that's why I say it's not human intelligible because what they've done is they've simply made an algorithm that tries to encode information in a way it can understand. So it's not, it's not meant for humans to understand, but it's trying to, the, the whole point of the algorithm is to group things that are similar into a similar spot in this large vector space, right? And so the, the reason that's why it has so many dimensions. So that way it can really, it has a lot of room to work with. So it can okay. place sentences all over the place. So just to um, in plain English, uh, you've taken these 4 million words or it, it, one particular firm here, let's say there are mm -hmm. neighbor clauses. Yep. Maybe on average, there are 1,000 or 5,000 clauses. Yep. And these five, we'll just take one year. The 5,000 clauses are transformed into some unintelligible 512 vector. Yeah, and so... Uh, but the, the and these ve this vector has elements uh, where the element uh, because it's a smaller group of uh, collection of objects. Yep. Uh, where does the similarity come in there? So uh, yeah, so so the whole idea is that we're just think of it as we're just trying to plot these sentences numerically, right? So we have all these different things, like five thousand sentences, right? We just uh, want to plot them somewhere so we can say are these close or not? Okay. We could do this with the words, right? But the problem is if you look at how many, you, I mean, we have 49 million sentences, like 47 million unique sentences, right? So we'd have 47 million dimensions, okay. which is not tractable, right? So this is a way of crunching that data down to just 512 <laughs> dimensions. And yeah. then, right, that, then we can cluster that, that's manageable. So the, the idea is simply, this is a sort of a, a patching layer to make things manageable mathematically, okay. Okay. Less, less so to add any sort of interpretive value, right? It's not, it's not helping you understand what we're doing, but it's yeah. necessary mathematically. Oh. That's sort of the idea. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. we get the other question going. Yep. Yeah, so just a follow up like, would you have like you something see, similar to the table you saw, show, showed earlier on how are you and all based on the clauses you have mm -hmm. chosen from like from the 4 million clauses that you have? Like, it's a similar table from yeah, the actual. Yeah, we, I can that do that. Uh, be, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we actually. I mean, I'm report... saying, mm, sorry. No, I was just saying that that would uh, help convince. A bit more yeah. because uh, I'm sure it works, but it's a bit more convincing <laughs> than that. that. That's fair. Yeah, I, we can add that. We actually I have that in my executive tweets paper already. This is not the, my first paper using this method. Um, so we kind of just sort of said, I, th I think we're kind of a little de deferring to that paper in this paper, but we, we can, we actually literally have this exact chart, but with tweets from executives in, in that paper. We can do the same thing in this paper just fine if that's helpful. So I think, yeah, if you say it's helpful, probably should add that. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely can do that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying, all right, so I think we, we covered universal sense coder. Now the next step is right now we've plotted all these in 512 dimensions. Now we just want to say, okay, how can we cluster these? Right. And we're just going to use standard clustering method, right? As that it's K means, but it's going to be a batched variant. Uh, this is again, something, an algorithm from Google. Cause they said, I mean, they work with more data than I have. And they said, well, we don't have computers big enough to analyze every web page in the world. So let's make a way to do it. And that's what they did. Um, now, the thing about k-means is you typically need to pick how many groups there are. That would be researcher bias. We don't want to do that. But thankfully, Tib Shirani has already solved this. Uh, so Tib Shirani is a statistician. He has a uh, 2001 paper that developed something called a gap statistic, which is a bootstrapped methodology for figuring out how many clusters you should have. Is it easy to do? No, it's extremely computationally intensive. but allows us to avoid bias. And so we do that. Um, so as I mentioned, right, the mini batch, we're just using the batch variant. Of, it works the same as usual k-means. So if you know k-means, you know this. It's just a way of feeding in observations in small batches rather than all at once, uh, because otherwise you need way more memory than we could have. Well, just one um, more thing, Richard, sorry to interrupt. Yep. I think this gap statistic, uh, it, it might help for the reader to give some intuition. <laughs> yeah. I a little bit. So I understand the idea in cluster yep. analysis. We are taking, let's say, we have two clusters, and so you're trying to 
uh, ensure that these two clusters are sufficiently different so that they would be classified as two clusters. So there, yep. there's some kind of a distance metric between the two clusters. Yep. So there's some criterion function which you're using, uh, right? So some intuition might help, I think. Just, yeah, just so I think the, the, the most intuitive way you can sort of phrase it is we wanna select the lowest number of clusters mm -hmm. such that the, the amount of log, scare, log scaled error we remove uh, by clustering on say K uh, clusters mm -hmm. um, on real data versus on simulated data, right? Is no worse than one standard deviation below adding an extra cluster, okay. right? That, that's the, the closest to intuition you can get out of this measure. It's quite complicated mathematically. Um, and so this is still fudging a little bit uh, to put it this way, um, sorry. Uh, but that's sort of the, the most intuition you can get, right? But the, the idea is to compare say 131 clusters versus 132 clusters and to say, well, 131 is sort of good enough compared to 132, right? Adding an extra 132nd cluster doesn't add that much extra. And so let's forgo it. Right? That, that's sort of the idea. Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that's the idea. That's what we do, right? We, we simulate a bit. We end up finding 131 is optimal. Uh, but again, this, this uh, simulation took like two weeks to run. So it's, uh, um, we, I, I've been tempted to actually run it on a supercomputer instead of locally because it takes so long. Um, so we may actually end up getting supercomputer uh, access to actually run the full version of the paper um, because we, we, we kind of, uh, if you read the appendix, you'll find we, we were a little less precise than we should be so far just because it's the first draft and figure we'll, we'll redo some of this. Um, but the next version of the simulation will be a bit, uh, bit more rigorous. Um, now we have done some validation of our measures already. Um, so for instance, we looked at say, um, well, first of all, how well the extractions keep sort of accounting context, right? So for instance, 95% uh, uh, of these extractions actually have a word from Campbell Harvey's dictionary. So almost all of them have some financial accounting context. 84% have something from the New York uh, State uh, Society of CPAs. Uh, we also did what's called an intrusion task. Uh, so it was, that's where we say we take, oh, say three words from one of our 131 clusters, actually three clauses, right? We take one clause from a different cluster and we ask, can we figure out which one doesn't belong, right? So if we essentially, it's just a you know, odd one out kind of test, right? So example of that is to say we have, say we establish reserves for tax positions, uh, uncertainties in income taxes, short-term borrowings totaled as December 31, 2017, and interpretation prescribes model for financial statement recognition of uncertain tax positions taken, right? And so if you're asked which one doesn't belong, well, you've got tax, tax, short-term borrowings, tax. So it's probably number three, right? And indeed it is number three in this case. And what we've done is we've done that at scale. Um, so I've done that myself. Uh, I get about 90% accuracy, which is surprisingly good. Uh, if you compare that to a typical, say the topic modeling papers, you typically end up getting about 50 to 60% accuracy with that type of algorithm. Uh, so this is actually a lot better than what we usually have been using in accounting. Um, yeah, besides that, we also uh, do, uh, yeah, so we've done this uh, regression, regressing MDNA sentiment on uh, clusters conditional on sentiment, um, just to see whether or not, uh, uh, yeah, just making sure that sort of these things line up as they should, it works pretty well. Um, uh, anyway, so you have another question, Srini? Yeah, yeah. Yep. I mean, maybe this is not a good question, but I'm still a little, uh, I want to ask it. Uh, yeah. When you uh, cut down your, um, whatever, I forgot the numbers, 18 million or 18 billion or something down to 4.5, you basically lose 75% of the text, right? Uh, and you're saying because you're focusing only on MDNA, and uh, mm -hmm. you're down to 25%, which is good for your uh, co computing complexity and all of that. Yeah, but, it's, right. but it's a little surprising that, given my knowledge of little knowledge of MDNA, mm -hmm. you lose 75%. I thought most of the MD MDNA is financial, right? So uh, I'm wondering what yeah. So you... so the issue is that it's not about losing. The MA, it's about these overlapping interpretations from our algorithm, right? Oh, yeah. So the, the right, it, it tends to sort of err on the side of being too expository, right? It's going to say, oh. I don't oh. know which one it is. So here have, have these four in this case, right? There are some sentences where it's given, say, a hundred different clause examples. Oh. And so it's not about, it's not about removing clauses entirely. Right, okay. but it's about selecting the way to interpret the clause. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Got so it. That, that's why it's purely just dimensionality reduction. It's not about removing MDNA text. Okay. Um, I will caveat, right? We would love to do full document, right? Because the other part of the question is like, we're looking at MDNA, right? Where it's not the full document. 
given it took so long to run this without full document, um, I would love to. I need more computing power before I can do that. Right? It, it's just it's just what we're stuck with. Um, so MDNA is at least tractable. Um, but yeah, if we can get uh, get more computing power, we'd love to run a full document. But that's why we're also look at something like earnings announcements where the documents are smaller. We can definitely do full document in that context, right? And that'll be, I think, quite nice. Uh, okay, so let's go over the empirics now. I think I, I have uh, 11 minutes or so. Um, so uh, yeah, we start with uh, yeah, we start with uh, all the MDNAs, right? Made up with 105 million, uh, sorry, 105,921 MDNA sections. Um, now we're going to end up having to require uh, a lot of variables. We follow essentially the same requirements as Law for McDonald 2011, right? That's going to knock us down to 35,000 MDNAs that actually fit, that have all the data in CompuStat and CRISP and such. Um, we'll get the sentiment measures, or uh, we'll use the Law for McDonald ones, except they don't, they provide the full text, they don't provide the MDNA. And so to get the MDNA sentiment measures, we're going to follow Brown, Crowley, and Elliott 2020, um, which is also my paper, right? So I have my own parser for this. Um, now, my full, full text sentiment measure is over 80% correlated with Law for McDonald, so it's uh, pretty, pretty similar. Um, so of course, we have different parsing methodologies, but the, the sentiment measure typically agrees, uh, so that's quite good. Uh, of course, typical of that is copy set, crisp, and auto analytics for material weaknesses. Uh, our empirics, pretty straightforward, actually, right? Uh, we sorry, start by... sorry, just one clarification. I, when I read the paper again, I didn't understand this full text sentiment. What, what is, is it like MDNA? Oh, yeah, yeah. So meaning the full 10K versus just the MDNA section. So Locker and McDonald don't post the MDNA stuff, is it? Uh, not that I saw. We, yeah. Um, if, if you know where they have it, then that, that would be great. Uh, but I didn't see it. Maybe actually WRDS SEC Analytics might have that. We may want to compare against them. That's a good point. Um, make a note of that. So Richard, is there any particular reason why you lose like half your MDNA sample? Oh uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's when we have a table in the paper showing sort of where all the, all the stuff comes from, but there, there's a lot of requirements for the sample for the Law for McDonald paper. And so we end up just losing a lot of observations because we need a lot of variables to be there essentially, or a lot of variables to be in within certain boundaries. Um, and so just to make our paper more comparable and so that our replication sort of is as close to replicating what they're doing as possible. Um, so yeah. So when you finally pass all your uh, sentences in the MDNA, mm -hmm. you have uh, sentences that contain LM sentiment words and mm -hmm. sentences which also don't contain LM sentiment words. Is Correct. that right? Yep. Yeah, uh, the, the only thing, like, as I said, we, we make sure we don't drop any LM sentiment words, right? But of course, if there was none to begin with, there's none to drop, we still keep the clause anyway. Okay, um, okay. so yeah, our approach is that it's, it's gonna be pretty straightforward. We're gonna use a mix of linear and something called lasso regression I'll cover on the next slide, right? But the idea is we're, start, we're gonna start by just putting LM sentiment on the left as a dependent variable and see which contexts drive that, right? So we'll add 131 context variables. Lasso is used because that way we don't have to worry about there being so many regressors, right? Otherwise, you'd say that there's totally going to be, you know, uh, say a lot of uh, multicollinearity there. Lasso will take care of that. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. One basic question again. Yep. Context, these are 131 dummies, right? Are they 131 dummy variables? No, it's gonna, it, no, no, it's going to be weights, right? Because we're going to okay. we're going to add up across the documents. So we have to weight everything. Um, okay. They're not dummies. Yeah. No. Right. Um, that means they're like a proportion, like, for example... Yes. Yeah, yeah. You, think of the, you think of them as proportions, yeah. Uh, 1.13% 1. 1. of the document talks about acquisitions. 1% uh, yep. talks about accounting method changes and so on. And so on. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And that's yep. varying across firm years. Yep. Okay, Correct. got it, yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. So then for our replication law for McDonald, we will use another regression, follow their, their specification exactly, right? They use industry fixed effects, so we'll follow this and do the same. And then we want to partition. We simply going to interact their law, their law for McDonald sentiment with those context weights, right? But actually it's not interacting. I should, I should be more specific. We're gonna condition, right? So we're gonna go back to the sentences and we'll, we'll construct the, at the sentence, to do the firm year sentence level, we'll construct the measures and then aggregate within that, right? So make sure it's as precise as possible. Uh, the last stuff I mentioned before is simply adding this one penalized term that penalizes based on the, essentially the, the coefficients of the regression, try to minimize coefficients um, this is your standard way of dealing with such a high uh, variance inflation factors, just because if we add 131 independent variables, you can 
be pretty sure we're going to have some multicollinearity issues. And so this takes care of that up front. Um, and then we optimize everything with the tenfold cross, uh, tenfold cross validation, which is just the standard approach to doing this. Um, yeah, so we're doing this in R. You can do it in Stata just fine. It's built into the, the current er versions of Stata these days. Um, but it's, uh, it's actually a very straightforward method. Uh, but since I don't have much time, I'm going to skip over that and just talk a little bit about the results. Um, so to start with, right, is that the first thing we want to look at is sort of which contexts are driving sentiment, right? So to sort of try to understand what is this measure typically driven by, right? And so we're going to essentially, um, we're going to split this up into a few different uh, uh, sets, right? The first set we're going to call high sentiment clusters. What I mean is these are clusters that are contexts that essentially drive sentiment in either direction, right? They just tend to be very sentiment laden, but it could be positive or negative, right? Essentially, they, they go both ways, right? They're just, they're just, there's always sentiment, right? So for instance, loss impairments, right? Or loan restructurings. It, I mean, yeah, it's probably more likely to be a bad thing. And you can see, of course, it's much stronger coefficient for bad things, but there's also some positive discussion of this. But when you see it, there's usually some law firm McDonald's sentiment tied to it, right? Likewise, net figures, right? Usually if you're talking about these net figures, like a net income, for instance, Typically, it's good or bad, right? It's not typically neutral. Um, same with like results and outcomes. Um, the one that we uh, most expected would be this decreases and increases in financials, right? So we're talking about changes in your financials and how that happened. Yeah, of course, there's going to be sentiment, right? So that, that's good to see. Um, that being said, there are some contexts that skew one way or the other as well, right? So there are some that skew negative, right? So for instance, discussing about liabilities or losses tends to be negative. That's as you'd expect, right? I think if we're discussing losses should be negative in general, um, right? But then we also have clusters that skew positive, right? Uh, so for instance, discussing about interest income, right? Because that's income that tends to be positive. Uh, you've got say leasing, right? For That one's kind of a bit weird in that if you, the law firm McDonald one says positive, if you hand read the, the samples, you'll, it doesn't quite look like it. Uh, so this, sometimes it looks like these are a bit of a miss on the, uh, Part. So the, the predictions that we have here are based on hand reading uh, a sample of, depending on the cluster, 10 to 50 uh, samples each. Um, and then uh, omitted from these slides here, we also have a group of clusters that doesn't have any sentiment at all, right? Oh no, sorry, it's right here. Yeah, so we have a bunch of clusters that either they, I mean, they, they typically are negatively predicting sentiment, right? So in this case, you have say discussion of cash flows. It doesn't typically have any sentiment words from law from McDonald. Um, and it's, it's, so it's, there's no negative, there's no positive either. Right? It tends to be neutral under its understanding. Um, then our next part is to dig into sort of a replication of a number of the tables from Law Firm McDonald 2011, right? So first is to look at filing period excess return, right? So there's sort of a short window return around the uh, announcement of the annual report. And uh, we can replicate the result just fine, right? The negative sentiment predicts lower return. Um, so that's good to see, right? We could replicate what they have, but then the question is, you know, which contexts are driving this or are, you know, is it all of the context, right? So no matter which context is, as long as it's negative sentiment that drives it or no, when you break it down, right? You'll see that actually for negative, uh, for negative law for McDonald words, only essentially seven contexts are driving the whole result, right? The other 124 don't drive it. Uh, there are two more that, that are technically negative, but they also drive positive. Uh, so essentially they, they, they sort of, they're inconsistent with what you'd want. Um, uh, and then there are some that are actually positive, right? Sometimes negative discussion in the annual report is driving, is positively related, right? So the opposite of what you'd expect, right? So you want negative to drive a decrease in stock returns. And sometimes negative actually drives an increase in stock returns. Right? So this is uh, going against what we would hope, essentially. Uh, on the positive side, right, you'd hope that positive discussion positively drives uh, stock returns. And it's split essentially even. right? So there's uh, sort of, what, five, or, uh, five each. Um, so five that positively drive stock return, five that negatively drive stock return when the discussion is positive per law for McDonald. Uh, so that's not great. right? Um, you, you would hope that uh, you would have seen much more positive in this one much more negative on this. And that would be sort of the ideal for those who are using this measure. Um, and then there are actually some cases where it's purely content driven, right? So even if we remove the sentiment entirely, so we take sentences that have no law from McDonald word, they still predict stock return, 
right? And in fact, even these neutral ones, so if you look at the replications R squared, right, it's about 0.1-ish, right? Um, if we drop all sentence or all clauses with law for McDonald words and only focus on the ones that don't even have any law for McDonald word, we actually beat that, right? So just the pure content without any law for McDonald sentiment is actually more informative about stock returns than sentiment is. Uh, so that's kind of, that, that's a pretty negative result uh, in terms of the, the usefulness of the dictionary. Um, but I think that the more disconcerting result is that it's not quite as lopsided as you'd hope, right? You really hope to see a lot of, yeah, a lot of these negative words, their negative uh, context, negatively predicting stock return as you would expect, right? And as uh, the sort of the results uh, from past papers show. Richard, uh, I have a, a comment or a suggestion. Or... Yep. So Lachlan McDonald published in 2014. Yep. Right. So I was thinking maybe if you split the sample and uh, see all these machines and bots and algorithmic traders, they mm -hmm. probably picked up on Lachlan and McDonald. Yep. And when they download the 10Ks uh, and they are using that in, to price the stock. Mm -hmm. right? yep. So maybe you, if you split the sample pre-2014 mm -hmm. and post-2014, I wonder if your results will be different for the two uh, periods. Mm -hmm. That's right. We, we can definitely do that. Um, yeah, I think that that's something we should do, right? And also to split like the to to the sample that they have as well would be good. Um, yeah, no, that that's fair. We can uh, we can definitely take take a look at that. Um, yeah. So then we look at a few other things, right? So we look at say abnormal uh, period uh, filing period abnormal volume, right? As to, again as defined by uh, Law Firm McDonald, um, we can replicate their uh, positive sentiment results. The negative sentiment result we can't actually replicate, which is. Uh, I mean, it's probably due to using MDNA instead of full text. Um, there's not much we can do about that. Um, but uh, now the prediction here is that more sentiment drives higher volume. That at least is borne out by our results, right? We see that it is skewed, that the negative sentiment positively predicts volume, positive sentiment positively predicts volume. That's what you want, and it is lopsided as it should be. But again, it's driven by a very small number of clusters, right? So it's like four clusters in the negative side driving the whole result. Um, and so it's... It's another case where, yes, it kind of works, right? But it's not really working as we'd hoped, right? It's not consistently working. It's only a few contexts that drive the whole result. Um, and uh, post now the post filing return volatility. This one works a little bit better, right? There's more contexts that are driving. Um, so again, it's 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 okay, but it's not. It's, again, it's a bit weaker than than you would hope if your goal or if if you're sort of rooting for the uh, old measure. Uh, lastly, we'll get future material weaknesses. Um, this one, we again, we, we'd predict, of course, that uh, more negative sentiment would positively predict material weaknesses. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that, that works. But for whatever reason, more positive sentiment also predicts more material weaknesses. So that's a bit weird, right? So in this, essentially, the, the result on the positive side of positive sort of negatively predicting material weaknesses is driven by a very small number of uh, clusters. And there's actually a lot more that go opposite to that. So really you have to be, sort of the punchline of a lot of this is that you have to be really careful what context you're looking at. Um, all right, so the, the punchline is, is sentiment a consistent contract? No, it doesn't seem like it based on the 10K analysis, right? Again, we will expand to say other, other settings as well, um, but certainly within 10Ks, it doesn't seem very consistent. For negative sentiment, right? There's only one group that even conti continuously loads. And in fact, this is, uh, this is one that will be gone in the next iteration of the algorithm, right? So the, the fact that there's a year-based measure is because we didn't censor out years and we'll fix that uh, going forward. Um, accounting assumptions is essentially your most consistent um, discussion for negative sentiment, right? That one's pretty reliable. Um, but besides that, only 10 contacts even load twice across these four regressions, 42 of them load once and the rest never even load, right? Whereas ideally, based on how we viewed sentiment measures in the past, it should always load regardless of context, right? That would sort of be, that'd be what we would ideally want to see given the measure. Uh, on the positive side, nothing loads to uh, every time or even three times, 11 load twice, 35 only load once, right? So again, it's not very consistent at all, right? Most of the time, right? Depending on your economic setting, what you're picking up is entirely separate from other economic settings, right? So essentially what we're saying is that, yeah, sure, you may have had a consistent sign and sentiment, in say volatility, stock return, material weakness, but the economic construct you're picking up is entirely different in each of these settings, right? And that's worrisome, 
Um, yeah, and then uh, for the for those who are care who care more about prediction, right? The other thing is to say that context by itself, irrespective of sentiment, actually is a better predictor. So if your whole goal is just prediction power, sentiment's not very good for that either. Um, and that, that's really the sort of the punchline there. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up. I'm happy to take any more questions after, but I know it's a little over time already. Um, so to wrap up, right? Um, I mean, essentially what we've done is we've built a uh, measure of context for really any type of document. We're using it for 10K MDNAs. Um, and I said, that'll be expanded to other document types going forward. The measure itself is very general, uh, just uh, 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 processor intensive. Um, then we're gonna regret, we regress sentiment and context, and we also replicate uh, sentiment results uh, by partitioning sentiment on these contexts. Uh, what do we find? Well, we find that first sentiment uh, relies more on some contexts than others, right? So it's not always, uh, I mean, it's essentially, it, it's related to certain things that uh, you, sometimes you'd expect, sometimes you wouldn't, um, but that's, I think that's okay, but it helps us to better understand what we're actually looking at. Um, second is that context is gonna matter when you're regressing on sentiment, right? So that some context or some results are driven only by a few contexts and that these contexts aren't necessarily consistent across different economic contexts, right? So at essentially different problems, I mean, we pick up different things using the exact same quantitative measure. Um, so that's, that's the uh, punchline of the paper. Um, yeah, happy to take any other questions you guys may have. Uh, that's all I've got for you guys today. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Richard. Yes. People have uh, uh, audience, uh, any questions for Richard? Um, so, hi, hi, Richard, if I can ask one, one question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so is 131 too many context topics? And is essentially, are you splitting the sentiment into two fine buckets and then hence Nothing, once you condition on that, nothing mm -hmm. essentially sticks. Yeah, so that's a good question, right? Uh, I mean, we're, we're relying on a statistical approach to get that, right? So you could always argue that maybe there should be less. Um, I think for our final draft, we will need to pick some, what, what are under the algorithm's perspective suboptimal, but uh, just smaller number of these to show that the result isn't sensitive to this assumption, right? Um, now, I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't really think it's too few. If you look at, you know, MDNA sections, manual reports, there's a lot of different things they discuss, right? And so the the number has to be fairly high to pick up all this, right? Um, but of course, it, it's very difficult for somebody to know what the true number should be, right? And so I think we, we do need to do some work on just showing that it's not sent, that our results are not sensitive to that. Good. And so, um... So typically when uh, people use other methods of topic modeling mm -hmm. on content in accounting and finance, yep. so how many kind of topics uh, uh, yeah, do they depends. come So up with? I have a paper at JAR where we, we end up using only 31 per year um, because we're conditioning on the number of topics that's most useful for uh, predicting intentional misreporting. Um, and we, sh but that, that sort of, it's a very specific use, right? So we're actually, we're, we're optimizing for predictive ability there rather than economic uh, understanding. Um, there's other papers that use as many as 500, which is probably too many. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the problem is there's no, there's no one way to do it. There's no correct right. way to do it per se, right? And so that's right. why it, it's always, it's always a tricky thing with these types of papers. Um, and the, be the best I think we can do is really to say, we'll, we'll show you, like, if you think 131 is too many, we can do 50. If you think 131 is too few, we can do 200. And like, we can show the results don't change, right? Fair but enough. of course, report the one that we think is best, which is the from the simulation. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Hmm? I had one question, John. Yeah. So uh, the LM list has uh, 2,300 or negative words and about 350 mm -hmm. positives, right? Yep. And so is it possible that there are a couple of words which are noisy, which are driving the entire result here, uh, rather well, than all of them? Uh, so it wouldn't drive our whole result, right? Because essentially, um, our, our context is going to pin, the, pin those just to a few contexts. Uh, so a great example of this is the word, uh, so on the positive side, the word effective. The word effective is in the positive dictionary, right? 
but about 90% of the time, the word effective happens to be about either effective dates or when some legislation is effective or regulation is effective, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, if they're talking about, say, effective operations or you know, effective internal controls, that's great, and that should be positive. And so it's more, it's slightly positive in terms of your expect, expected sign, and it gets listed as positive in B measure, but most of the time it's useless, right? But the thing is, our context would pin those effective dates to discussions of effective dates. It pins mm -hmm. the effective regulation to discussions of regulation. And so it doesn't taint the other 129 contexts. Right, and so, so, we, we, so we're fairly isolated from that issue, whereas it's definitely a problem for the actual measure. So in a sense, not using the word list is probably part of the context, right? Yeah, maybe, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and how does, um, uh, I'm sure you've, uh, you would have thought of this, um, when um, you use the same measure, to, let's say measure comparability, like mm -hmm. Peter such part of it, um, that, so you were mentioning cosine similarity earlier. Does this do a better job of uh, measuring comparability? Uh, comparability in the accounting sense or the, the computer science sense? The, the 10K uh, disclosure comparability. Sense. Yeah, just, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, did you mean from an investor perspective or no? Because that changes um, my answer. Um, yeah, um, like in terms of comparing disclosure comparability, like for a, yeah for a, for an investor. Yeah, so there, right? There's a lot of other things that make up disclosure comparability that makes it. I mean, cosine similarity is definitely not going to to do it. So this is probably better than that. But I'm mm -hmm. not sure I would say that this is a great way to approach that problem either because it's it's a very uh, it's very sensitive to the way things are sort of set up, right? Even something just like where information is in a document could affect that if we really sort of dig into it, right? So at a construct level, it's it's really tough to get at um, precisely, right? And so I guess, I, I say the contexts are perhaps useful for that, um, but they're not going to get you all the way there, right? You'll need something that's a bit more custom designed to pick that up. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, maybe if anyone wants to have uh, one more question and uh, or we can... Uh, uh, Richard, uh, this is Nikhil here. Yep. So uh, I have a very basic clarification question. So Stanford NLP uh, program, they have a GLOBE project. So they find, I, I'm sure you must be familiar with that. So they find all these word vectors for uh, Wikipedia mm -hmm. uh, or, yep. Uh, yep. or using those billions of documents. Yep. What you do, what you're doing here is do the same using 10K reports because 10K are different from news wires. Is that uh, what it's you're not, No, 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 it's not, it's not the same. So Glove is what's called a word embedding, right? Um, so another example of that is also something called word hmm. to vec, right? So these are sort of two very standard approaches. Um, actually, I use Glove in my, uh, my, my uh, fraud detection paper. Um, so Glove, right, is to try and say, what is the meaning of an individual word? Hmm. But it, it assigns meaning based on context, but it's not in the context that you're looking at, right? It's saying based on the context it's seen in other data sets, what's the meaning of your individual word, right? And so if you give it, say, the word loss in any context, it doesn't know the difference, right? It's just loss is whatever that vector is in glove, right? Okay. And so, I mean, the nice thing is you can train it to a specific context, right? Um, so we do some stuff like that. For instance, we've, we've done... Uh, uh, so the, for a comparable algorithm word to vac, we've trained that on just Wall Street Journal, right? So what does a word mean in the context of the Wall Street Journal, right? So it's nice for that kind of analysis, but it can't tell you about the greater context that's specific to the sentences you have, right? That's okay. not something you can do, right? So in, in the case of our algorithm, right? When it, you have the word loss, right? It's going to be conditioned on the exact sentence that that company used in that particular part of the document. Right. And even in the same document in two different spots, it'll have different meanings. Okay. So, so, so instead of a word, you're using the sentence clause as you showed in the slide. Correct. Yes. And, so then, our measures is and then finding those word embeddings. Uh, well, we're not doing word embeddings. We're, we're doing clause embeddings effectively. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry. Clause yep. embeddings. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Hmm? Okay. 
Thanks, everybody, for coming for this uh, very interesting seminar. Thanks a lot, Richard, for taking yeah. time to share your research with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in other, uh, situ in other conferences. <laughs> yeah, yep. Th thanks for inviting me. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll see each other <laughs> again soon enough. Thank you. Uh, th th thanks, Richard. Really enjoyed yeah. that. Th thanks, Srini, for inviting me. Yeah, th thanks, Prachi. Glad to see you here. <laughs>